Hello my fine friends, welcome to episode 296 of Rahalasta Pub. We've done way more than that, but still it seems magical. Episode 300, I will be the guest and John Robbins is going to be interviewing me. We might even do it in front of a live audience if time and disease allows, but I'll let you know about more about that later. Meanwhile, you can keep watching these live on Wednesday nights on my Twitch channel, twitch.tv slash RK Herring. We've got Stevie Martin, we've got John Cairns, we've got Ed Gamble and loads more to come. Um, and as lockdown will inevitably continue, this will probably go on forever and ever, though there may be a chance of doing some live ones soon. soon. My book, The Problem With Men, is out on November the 5th. Not November the 19th, but it, you can get it on November the, 5th, November the 5th, so you're ready for November the 19th. You can pre-order now wherever you get your books, ebooks, or audiobooks. Uh, I've just been recording the audiobook this week. It's a lot of fun with lots of extra content, including Deborah Francis White chatting about feminism with me for an hour, uh, and Alistair Green reading out some of the funnier tweets from the day so there's lots of bonus content on the audiobook if you want to get that also taskmaster starts on the 15th of october on channel 4 on 9 p.m i'm back on the telly i don't need you anymore this is it it's over i never liked you guys anyway i was using you to get back on the tv and it only took 12 long years of podcasting now i'm famous again and i don't need you ha 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 so, anyway, I hope you enjoy Rahalas uh, number 296 with the incredible Michael Fenton Stevens from Radioactive, The Chicken Song, and pretty much every comedy show of the last 20 to 30 years. Uh, he's a wonderful, lovely man, and you are going to love this interview with him. He's brilliant. Sit back, relax, and enjoy Rahala Stupper. Hello, welcome a man who's broken his knobs. It's Richard Herring. Hello, welcome. Thank you for joining us. So we're going up a touch late. We've had some technical issues. Hopefully they're all sorted out now. Uh, welcome to Richard Herring's Left Wing Satirist Terminated podcast. Oh, yes. Uh, that's what we call it. Um, yeah, we're only doing right wing jokes from now on. That's that's the new to, so we can get back on the BBC. That's the new uh, direction for the podcast. I think Brexit's going great and Boris Johnson's doing a brilliant job. We cannot take the piss out of the government anymore. That is, And I want to be alive when the fascist state takes over. So I'm, I, for one, welcome our new fascist overlords. Could be called the Leicester Square Theatre tonight. Look. Oh, okay, that way. Oh, it doesn't really help. Look, we're at the Leicester Square Theatre. Really, we're really there. How amazing. Um, though I was... Uh, I was hanging around at Legoland uh, the other day uh, and <laughs> a man dressed as Unikitty, that's Unikitty if you don't know who it is, um, uh, posing for socially distanced photographs with small children, says he calls it Rahalas to I don't know if that's going to catch on. Um, hopefully it will. Uh, and uh, yeah, with Legoland, this was our big bank holiday treat uh, back at the end of August, if you're listening or watching this in the future. Uh, and took the kids to Legoland. They were a bit too young for most of it, I have to say. Uh, my daughter was, we queued for an hour for a ride that my son was too small to get on and my daughter was terrified by. And that was the start of our wonderful trip. My favourite thing, though, was uh, I saw a, a quite hard-looking guy wearing a Slipknot hoodie. Uh, that's Slipknot if you're not aware of them. Uh, but the effect was slightly diminished by the fact he was carrying a sort of purple fluffy unicorn for his daughter and had just exited a fairy tale boat ride that uh, looks like this. So that sort of is parenthood down to its essence, how it's distilled into what it destroys you and everything you once stood for uh, and creates these juxtapositions. But we're still people. We're still people, parents. We're still allowed to like Slipknot. I love them. I love their old, Back there, music. Um, uh, uh, he hello, I, I'm in Slipknot. That's my favourite of the Slipknot songs. They're very good. Um, oh, and I made it to Edinburgh. I made it to Edinburgh this week as well. Incredible scenes. I uh, thought I wouldn't get there, but for the last day of the 
friends. There I am by Edinburgh Castle. I made it up there. It was good to be back, just even though we couldn't do the fringe this year. That's Legoland, you idiots. It's I'm in Legoland. It's an Edinburgh Castle in Legoland. It's, I'm still in Legoland. That's all that's happened to me. All I'm doing in my life is streaming and looking after kids. That's it. We went to see some dinosaurs in Nebworth. The kids ate their dinner. They ate their picnic. It was really cold, so they sat in the boot of our people carrier car and <laughs> ate their sandwiches. They were very excited. But when the 70s and 80s, that's how we used to travel around. It was a better time, wasn't it, in the 70s and 80s? You, the kids just put them in the boot with all the suitcases. No one cared. No seat belts. Don't worry. After Brexit, we're all going back to that. And Brexit is a brilliant thing. See, right wing comedy is easy. It's fantastic. We'll all get to go in cars with no seatbelts and just be sat amongst suitcases. And if we crash, the suitcases will probably protect us. That's that's the way I look at it. And I've been arguing all day on Twitter. I've been sitting in a garage waiting for my car to be mended. And they haven't even really mended it properly. Uh, and arguing with people about whether all comedy is political. And it's got right on my tits. People saying, oh, I said, is a fart political? People go, yes, it can be. And I said, but is it always? No, wait, let's not get into it. Let's not get into it again. Not everything's political all the time, but it will be soon. Anyway, let's welcome our amazing guest this week. Uh, it's hard to choose what he's best known for. He's best known for so many things. You wouldn't <laughs> believe it. I think he's probably best known for playing Mr. Sour Grapes on Hotel Trouble, though he was also Miles on Mike and Angelo. Come on. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, it's Michael Fenton Stevens. There he is. Hello, how He's are you? He's in the Leicester Square Theatre with me. Oh, look, it's a oh, hello, crowd. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Police Quieten Down, Quieten Down. <laughs> how are you doing, Michael? Lovely uh, to have you. I'm on. very well. It's lovely to be here. It's really exciting to to uh, to turn the tables, as it were, because I've done a podcast with you. I have been a guest on yours. Yeah, and, and now, now we're going the other on... way around. Which is and uh, now I'm going to rip you apart. I never thought you'd be stupid enough to do it, but you know, <laughs> it, here you are. <laughs> it, well, we've had, I was saying to you before, we've had a lot of young people on recently, so I thought it's time, <laughs> to something for the grandmas. Someone <laughs> very <laughs> close to their grave, you know. <laughs> we're going to talk about a lot of shows that most people watching will not remember. No, and, and we'll be lucky so if I remember ago. them. That's so long ago. Do you remember being... Well, let's talk about Miles from Michelangelo. Do you remember being Michelangelo? Do you remember the premise of Michelangelo? <laughs> this is one of your earlier jobs, now, I think. You've you've done a, a great job there because you've just about chosen the only thing I have no memory of at all. <laughs> Nothing. I, I vaguely remember the show. There's something about an alien, I think. There's an alien and there's an American in it and they... Oh, God, yeah. I vaguely remember it. I think it was a kid's team. TV show, which I vaguely remember. I don't know. Um, yeah, yeah, I remember no, Hotel Trouble. Remember. I remember Hotel acting Trouble. Credits. I can remember. Hundred, hun, hotel <laughs> Trouble. Do you remember Hotel Trouble? Yeah, I do. Yeah, yeah. We filmed Mr. it on the, a, sort of a, a, an industrial estate somewhere near Heathrow Airport, okay. which, which also meant that every 45 seconds we had to stop because an aeroplane went over. Yeah. I mean, w great. Well done. Good idea. Let's let's open a television studio here, right next to the runway of at, you know Heathrow number four. It was it was ridiculous? I I've never, was I've cheap, never spent. What well, it was cheap, yeah. It was very <laughs> very cheap. And uh, the thing I liked about it is, that at some point in that thing, I had to be bald, right? And they and they couldn't afford to get one of those bald caps and stick it on and everything. The makeup was too thin. And the woman said to me, "This is fine. What we do now is we we'll, we spray it with lacquer, uh, really really fine, and we flatten it right down, and then we'll paint your head, and it'll be fine." And and actually, it really did work. But the, the the lacquer and the paint combined to make it go completely solid. It was like I was wearing some sort of bowl on my head. And and then uh, they didn't have facilities to wash because we were on a housing estate in, you know, an <laughs> industrial estate somewhere near Heathrow. So they didn't have a shower or anything. So I, had, I drove home that night and I got home and went in. And there I was bald. I mean, completely bald. And my wife said, what the fuck have you done? <laughs> And I said, it's, I said, well, I just thought, you know, they said, could we shave it? And I said, yeah, sure. She said, but you'll, you won't be able to work for months. What if you do an idiot? <laughs> she was completely full by it. So obviously the makeup was good. Well, that's good. It works. And yeah. then all your hair fell out because you had washed <laughs> almost, it out. Almost. <laughs> when, I, when I did it, I did it do great clumps of it coming oh, out. Because, <laughs> and as you can see, it's come back thick and lush and gorgeous. Wow. Well, I hope I could just – I'm tempted just to go through IMDb, <laughs> every single acting job. I said 100 acting credits. That's extraordinary. Yeah. There's lots of big things we could talk about. But I think what's amazing about your career is – 
you've been in sort of everything. Oh, right. All the, yeah, all, lots of things. In the yeah. last 20 or 30 years. And the one, you're one in thing one is, episode no, nearly everything. That's exactly it. I'm in one episode. <laughs> I mean, so I wasn't good enough to, to keep around. You know, they went, yeah, bring him in for one and get rid of him. No, you know, just super sub, come in, make a big splash. I, I, get am, out, I am the Oli Gunnar Solskjaer of acting. Yes. That's who I am. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Come in, winning goal, get the European Cup, and then go home, and then I might go and play for someone else. It's, uh, yeah. yeah, but well, we were t- again before we start. We briefly mentioned uh, "Only Fools and Horses," which mm-hmm. is one of the the. I mean, it's one of the most famous television programs in the world. So it's one yeah. of the most more notable programs you've been on. But the character you played on that of the of the guy from the group was it the Groovy Gang? The groovy Gang, yeah. The the hol- yeah. I was the holiday rep on the episode where he wins a painting competition because yeah. he's such a memorable episode. It's, I mean, it's often voted the best. Apparently, yeah. you know. I mean, uh, and and to this day. Almost every day I get a, a Facebook, somebody gets in touch with me or on Twitter and they say, you know, just groovy and put a thumb up, you know, and, and I sort of, I think, mm, then I can't resist it. I just go, yeah, groovy back, <laughs> you know, like a, some sad old thing, just groovy. And then that's it. We're friends. That's it because yeah. I've responded. Uh, we're best mates. Actually, I, I, I had to give Rodney a groovy gang badge. Get it, and I do have it. It might be around here somewhere. I do have it. Some of the actual groovy gang badge from that thing, which I'm fairly sure, knowing how much money people from Only Fours and Horses get paid for things that they own, <laughs> that is get worth. It on eBay. Hey, get it on there. Could be worth money. But no, what I did was I got fed up with people saying, "Yeah, I've got a groovy back gang badge," over. and I said, uh, "No, why would I? I would. Why? I, you know, yeah, I'm going to bring five hundred home with me after the recording. And actually, I could have done. They did have bags of the bloody things, and so so I had them made. I had. I thought right. Okay, so I just I got in touch with those badge makers. I designed it and did it as it was originally. Had it made, and now I have these groovy gang badges. And actually, when people say to me, "Can I have a groovy gang, groovy gang badge?" I say, "Yeah, you can." Yeah. Do you have them with you at all times in case that happens? I, just, I have pockets <laughs> clinking and chinking. All the I mean, time, yeah. if it had been the only job you'd ever done, <laughs> and you were doing that, I think that would be quite tragic. But seeing that you have done other work, <laughs> it, it was your only tragic. job. I'm the guy. It's me, me <laughs> from the groovy. <laughs> Groovy, everyone. Just giving people the badges before they've asked. <laughs> Can't you remember? remember Walking me? down the street. How were how were the? I mean, I'm quite obsessed with Nicholas Lindhurst. I don't think you were in this one. Good night, sweartheart. I don't think you did. No, you did I didn't do Good night, sweetheart. No, no, no. Um, <clears> as <throat> I found the one program you did do. The yeah, last it was a lo- lovely, lovely program. I like that. But right. I'm, uh, I'm quite obsessed with Lindhurst. Yeah. He's, uh, he's very professional. I think they're both very professional. Are they? they or, or he's. They take it very seriously, I think, don't they? They do. He did. Which is I mean, actually, I, I'm not sure all the way. The thing I remember about rehearsals for Only Fools was that, in fact, when you know everybody else was rehearsing, he was going through the property pages and uh, and looking at. And I remember him saying, "That's a nice flat, isn't it?" And he spent the whole time basically saying, "I'm getting paid a fortune here, and I'm going to set myself up." So, so every week he'd get his wages, and every week he'd buy a flat in Chelsea. Right. And, and and now must have the most extraordinary property portfolio, a bit like Hugh Grant. And, uh, you know, there are, other, there are a number of actors who've done that. They've taken that one moment of success and yeah. they've set themselves up. Unlike you or I, Richard, yes. clearly. Well, what know, we did we was we went down the pub. Fritted it away. We were like Rodney. We were like the real Rodney. We're the real we ones, just yeah. put, it on, put it in schemes. Uh, he invested wisely and I'm sure has done very well. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so uh, yeah, let's well let's go back to the beginning to start with okay. because I think that's you you, I mean you had success very early really you were you were in an Oxford review in about seventy nine I want to say that's right yeah Oxford yeah review, and um, which uh, was only eight years before my Oxford uh, te- yeah I was I was eighty nine years I was eighty eight I think wow I um, so. Uh, We'll, we'll have done exactly the same things because when I talked to Michael Palin, he'd stayed in all the same places. Yes. You will have stayed in Edinburgh. He stayed in, <laughs> you sleep in the Johnston Terrace. Johnston Terrace, uh, yeah. The, uh, the, the Masonic Lodge. Yes. Um, and you and you had sort of discovered, which was still possible then, you were the year after Rowan Atkinson, so I guess the Oxford It's a difficult, a difficult act to follow, though, isn't it? Like, yeah. You know, because everybody was saying, oh, my God. But what it did, of course, was it brought everybody to see our show because they thought, yeah. you know, Rowan Atkinson was last year. Let's see who there is this, this year. And, in fact, uh, the person that they noticed, I think, probably in our review, um, was the writer. 
Uh, so it, none of us as performers were really picked up immediately because right. because uh, a lot of the stuff was written by Richard Curtis. Oh, okay. Because he'd written Rowan's stuff and everything. And he was uh, also up in Edinburgh at the time doing the one-man show with Ed- with. You know, I always thought it's strange, isn't it, that Rowan Atkinson has a one-man show which has another person in it. Yes. It would be like you being the other person, you know, in in the Stuart Lee show. It yes. Just well, be... oh, now come off it. Don't say it. Don't say it. <laughs> it's not true. It's already been said, Michael. I get. I understand what you're saying. I get it. Okay. All right. Thank you. One nil to you. <laughs> we'll be back. Anyway. I saw that show with Rome with Angus Deaton was playing the, right, yeah. uh, the the straight man. Yeah, he did. So he, Richard, he did. He did it for years. Did it originally, did he? Richard did it originally. Yeah, and then uh, and I think he did it, and then Angus took over and did it in the West End, and then he went to Broadway. I remember uh, Angus saying, you know, almost that. Well, bye everyone. We had a party, and all shook his hands and said bye. See you. He said, if you're ever in New York, you know, look me up, and. Basically, he sort of rented out his, his flat in London and just said, I'm off to New York. It's going to be great. And they all went off to New York and they did the opening night. And the big critic in New York absolutely slated the show and it right. closed the next night. Oh, no. That was it. So, you know, Rowan, who is enormously successful, had that incredible failure in America. And and Angus was back. I mean, it's like yeah. it's almost like you you said, oh, I'm going to really miss him. I'm going to. And you turned and went, Angus. I thought you'd just gone, oh, you're back. And and there he was, back in the room. And uh, and it, it was never mentioned again, I think. Yeah. You know. But you sort of, you fell into comedy. You were an actor. You were doing lots of acting at university. Yeah, exactly that. And you sort of fell into comedy almost by mistake through <laughs> yes. meeting Angus. Is that right? Well, exactly through meeting yeah. Angus. Yeah, he auditioned me for the review. I mean, I was going to go up to Edinburgh and do serious stuff. Uh, I did do serious stuff. We did. I did four other plays, I think, while I was up there, and the review the first year I was up there. And the four other plays were absurd things. We did a thing called the Lorenzaccio story, where they had a scene in it where everybody, apart from me and um, Tim McInerney, were everybody else was behind us, standing in a line, stark bollock naked. And I, I, to this day, I don't know why. And it was it was um, directed by a, a bloke called Jeremy Howe, who I think is head of like, entertainment or head of the BBC drama or something now, but he's very powerful. Or he may be in charge of the archers, something like that. You know, he was he did it, and he thought this was a very important scene. Unfortunately, there was a bloke in the cast who had the biggest cock you've ever seen in your life. It was really huge, a down to the knee cock, one of those, you know. And uh, he, and so it was pointless doing this scene. Tim and I used to pull faces at each other because we knew nobody was looking. <laughs> and we did, we did one show where um, where there was an audience of three, and there were yeah. fifteen of us in that cast. <laughs> and, and and at one point, twelve of no, well, yeah, thirteen of them were naked, <laughs> and in front of three people, one of whom was my wife to be. Who was, wow! Who was sitting there knitting? Is that, is that how you met? <laughs> no, no, no. She's, she's luckily I've got. I, I, well, at least he hasn't got his cock out. <laughs> It'll be a surprise. If I'd met her after back. the man with the cock, she would okay. never have gone with me. No, that's it's no good. <laughs> no, no, it would have spoiled everything for her. But luckily, <laughs> she was stuck with me by then. So she was, you know, she was my girlfriend, and uh, we are now married, still married. And she was sitting there knitting. I think. Through the entire thing, all going to hear was this tick, 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 and then another lady who I'm sure had come to see something else because she kept every time there was a blackout, you'd come back and she'd be a seat up, she'd slowly moving up the the auditorium, in the hope that she would manage to get to the exit without upsetting us. It was terrible. Anyway, we did uh, that, but we did the review in the evening, and and I think almost certainly as as a result of the fact that at the end of the review. We sang this brilliant uh, parody of the Bee Gees that Philip Pope and Richard Curtis had written, uh, I think called uh, Meaningless Songs in Very High Voices, and we were called the Heebie Jeebies. And we had sort of leather jackets on and wired scarves and all that sort of stuff. And it's a very funny song, still is to this yeah. day. And we were approached almost immediately by people who said, Do you want to record this? Do you want to make a record? And then Jimmy Mulville, who actually runs Hattrick Productions, or owns Hattrick Productions, uh, he was a radio producer at the time and came and said, do you want to do a pilot for the BBC? So we did a pilot when I was in my third year at university. So it was a very strange thing to be, you know, it's like, oh, this is easy, this acting lark. It's brilliant. (laughs) 
<laughs> well, that's why by the time I was in Edinburgh, everyone was going, if you're at Oxford, they just get you on TV straight away and yeah. everyone hated it. So it's that I had a terrible time as a result of... Well, I think that may be true. Overnight successes. <laughs> Although, you know, everything gets paid back. Eventually, we did we did KYTV. We, we, uh, we went on and did that radio show and it was called Radioactive. And we did seven series of that. And it, it won loads of awards. It, it even won an award, <laughs> an absurd title for an award. It was called the Primer Sondas Award. Uh, presented in Spain, and the title of it was Best Radio Program in Europe. Right. So for a silly comedy show to win that, that's not bad, is it? The BBC were impressed. I think the BBC have only won it three times in their history. Uh, Anyway, we won this award, and then we went to the the telly and did KYTV, and we won uh, the Montreux Festival as well. And they got us together and said, you know, well, fantastic, we're so pleased. Your, Your career is safe with the BBC. And, of course, I didn't work for the BBC for six years after that. <laughs> they they cancelled the thing. And this is where I'm talking about, you know, every, everybody gets caught up eventually because we were, we were thrown out to a large extent because the day-to-day came along and on the hour. And, yeah. you know, and who wouldn't throw us out for on the hour? <laughs> I would. You know, and so Patrick Marlborough and Chris Morris and uh, Steve Coog and everything came in and uh, Rebecca Front, and all, uh, who I think you've met Rebecca, haven't you? I I I was uh, I know all, all of those people vaguely. Yeah. I, I did write for on the air, and then I was thrown off on the air. Well, we we left on the air for the day to day. Yeah, it was a mutual decision. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, I wonder what life would have been if like if we had. Uh, but the heebie-jeebies, which yeah. I do remember, great. The thing with for me, radioactive. My brother was got into radioactive, and then got me into radioactive. I think KYTV. I was watching some of it today, and it, and I don't think I I saw that much of it. I think it no. came out at a time when. I was probably at university and didn't have a TV, I think. So I was listening to the radio. <laughs> We're still listening to yeah. a radioactive, but there's a big chunk of my life where you kind of miss out on stuff. I definitely saw some of it, and it's great. But we loved radioactive. But the heebie-jeebies, let's talk about first. Yeah, okay. Because that was, that was a sensation. You travelled all over the world. You were you were caught up in Live Aid almost. In yeah, we had <laughs> some quite ridiculous things. It's really yeah. odd. I've never quite understood how when you're doing a parody of someone or you're pretending to be someone, people start treating you as if you are that person. So we would we did a tour of Australia where we were constantly being in, you know we go to nightclubs and people would say this way this way and they take us to sort of closed off areas. We did one and then suddenly this man said, oh, "Sorry, I'm sorry. W- would you mind if we did a fashion show for you?" And we went, "Yeah, all right." And all these extraordinary women came in and then paraded in front of us in different clothes and we're going, "Very nice, thanks." <laughs> It's eleven o'clock at night. We've just what's what's going on? It was madness, and we yeah. would. Uh, I think maybe um, we had a manager called Martin Bergman, who you may remember was also an ex Cambridge footlighter, but he was a he was a, a brilliant man. He would always ring places up and say, "Hello, yes, it's Martin Bergman here. I'm the manager of the Hebrides," and, uh, and they would go, "Sorry, yeah, the, the Hebrides," uh, and we got into all sorts of places. We went to the uh, the Melbourne Cup to see the uh, the races that Martin arranged for us. And he said, we're going to the Melbourne Cup, everybody. So we went, okay. So we turned up in shorts and T-shirts. And they said, you, you can't go in the um, – he said, stand back. Hang on a minute. I'll go and talk to them. And he went forward. And apparently he said to this man, uh, did you get the telegram? And the man said, sorry, sir, I, I don't know who you are. He said, uh, yeah, Martin Bergman, the man at Ascot, uh, the, uh, the, the steward at Ascot, he said he would uh, t- send a telegram to you. I'm here with the Bee Gees. And uh, – and the man got into a panic and said, "I'm sorry, sir, we haven't got it." He said, "Oh, this is uh, this is absolutely ridiculous. I've never known anything so. What uh, what sort of organisation is this? Make a great big fuss. We were shown through to the royal enclosure, and uh, provided with suits and jackets and you know and things, and just given loads of champagne. It was um it was brilliant fun. And we did do it one of those. They had a sort of a live aid thing in in Australia. They had their own live aid concert, right. and we um we were put on the top of the bill because we were the only foreign act." So, so they had, you know, people like men at work, and uh, even in excess, they regarded New Zealanders as being sort of the same, you know. So, uh, yeah. so as the only foreign group, we went on, and now finally, ladies and gentlemen, will you please welcome the heebie-jeebies? And you've heard it, a great roar of who the fuck. <laughs> <laughs> and we wandered on and, and sang to our backing track. It was absolutely absurd. 
But we did, we went to, I remember turning up to that thing. We turned up, they sent this enormous limousine and we were all picked up and we went to this thing and we were dropped at the gates of the limousine and, and this enormous crowd of, uh, of girls came charging towards us. And, and that's, we thought, wow, God, we've been, we're a hit. And, and then we got out the car and they got about 10 feet from us and then went, nah, and turned and walked <laughs> away. <laughs> that, that is a very disappointing thing when you're, you know, when you're basically 23 and you think, you know, I've made it, here we go. Uh, and no, they weren't interested at all. Oh dear! Well, what? what did would you do? A whole was there an album? Was it was it enough songs yeah. for an album with the heebie-jeebies? Yeah, it was. We did two albums, in fact. We did. We we in the end, we were just. Um, they said, "Can you do anyone else?" So we said, "I don't know. We'll have a go." So we started writing other songs. We did David Bowie. We did uh, Status Quo, uh, Paul McCartney and Wings and uh, the, the Eagles, Prince. Just low down, you know, Spandau Ballet. We did, we just did whoever we wanted to, which of course led on to the fact that, um, you know, having done all that, we were then, uh, I think probably we were asked if we wanted to, to work on not the nine o'clock news, which was still going at the time. And, uh, and, and I think rather foolishly, we thought we'd, we now we're going to hold out for our own series. <laughs> <laughs> and then, uh, and then Spitting Image came along. So it was John Lloyd yeah. twice, really. John Lloyd eventually sort of got his way. And said, "Would you come and do the same sort of thing on on that?" So we did. We went and did Spitting Image, and uh, and ended up doing all those songs on that. You know, which was yeah. brilliant fun. Yeah. Well, and we'll, we'll talk about it. There was. I think we'll have to mention it. I know you've talked about it a lot, but you were you were the lead singer on the Chicken Song, which I think I was. Again, people of a certain vintage will remember. Yeah, I had, I, got I, mean, a, I had a strange fascination with uh, with number ones. After that, I suddenly thought, "I've had a number one." I've been to number one. It's a very weird feeling. I was on holiday when it went to number one. And I was, because, you know, in those days, you didn't have mobile phones and things. I had no idea. And I, I came back to find my answer phone it was just hundreds of messages. I thought, oh, my God, my dad's dead, you know. But it, it, what, what it was, people were saying, congratulations, how brilliant. And nobody said what it was for. And I, <laughs> I thought, Congra- what have I done? I don't know what I've done. And, and then... Um, we looked at Phil Pope rang me and said, it's number one. And I went, oh, my God, how extraordinary. So I, 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 I wandered around thinking, oh, what do I do? I'm number one. And actually what I did was I went to WH Smith and then went up to the counter and said, have you, have you got a thing called, um, have you got a chicken? Is a chicken song thing? She went, yeah, yeah, yeah. I said, oh, right. She said, do you want the 12-inch version or the, the, the single? And I said, um, I'll, I'll, take, I'll have both. And she wrapped them up. And then I did that. You know, you must have done this, Rich, that thing that, where you just can't resist it, although you know it's a stupid thing to do. I actually just went to her, yeah, that's, um, that's actually, that's, that's me. Like that. <laughs> and she went, is it? <laughs> and that was it. That's all I got. I would say, yeah. You I, have to go around with the puppet all the time, the puppet that sings the main bit. A groovy gang going. badge. If I'd had the movie gun badge. It's me, the puppet. I'm the, uh, <laughs> um, but you were quite canny. I heard this today on another podcast. Oh, but God, uh, yeah. everyone else just took a flat fee for recording it. Because it was in the TV show first, right? And I presume this one, oh, for a bit of fun, we'll release it. Soon. Yeah, absolutely. That's what it was. It was, it was, it was, it was, it was uh, taking the piss out of Black Lace, I do all that sort of. There was a big hit number of hits in the 80s of these sort of meaningless stupid songs Absolutely. and it was a very funny passage of that yeah we, so we you really everyone did. else just took the thousand pounds and you decided to take the percentage points that's exactly right what, yes yeah yeah i did because you know i mean i didn't have the experience to know that it was wiser to take the money take the take the fee you're going to get some money actually going to make some money and i went no, no it's just i've never been on a record before that you know you know what i had but I, I thought you know i'm the lead singer on this i'm gonna you know yeah let's let's take a gamble and of course it sold seven hundred and fifty thousand copies and <laughs> the other people were on it to this day there's um uh, kate robbins was on it you know you've, yes. you've had kate as a guest and uh you know and she she to this day she always calls me mr mr 0.5 percent <laughs> oh you and your fucking percent yeah how much did you get how much did you get how much did you get come on i know I said, it wasn't much. I didn't buy many houses, Kate. You know, it just wind her up. It, well, it wasn't You much. know Rodney from Only Fools. Yeah, say, yeah. Let's say that. It, was not, it wasn't that. One a week. No. Um, but you did do a lot of uh, ads in that because it, it's, oh, it's quite unusual. That you became quite wealthy as an actor straight, sort of straight away. Yeah. Which must have been, must have been 
a, a nice thing. Yeah, I've got gradually <laughs> poorer. Realistic. It's been, yeah. it's been just start. I've done the opposite of, of what I should have done, which is I was going to have a, a, I was going to be a lawyer. So I would have started out, you know, struggling, struggling. Can I make it? I'm just a young junior, and I, I might get a case, you know. And, and now I'd be living in a, an enormous house in the country and uh, and have a place in Italy and all that sort of thing. So I've gone down the opposite. I started earning ridiculous sums of money and <laughs> it slowly just gone, you know. I mean, I suppose it's, there's two schools of thought. Because funny, I talk. We, me, and uh, Stu worked with. Uh, we did a sketch show with Patrick Marber and Steve Coogan before everything kind of took off. We'd done on the hour together, and we did a, a sketch show in Edinburgh trying to bring back the sketch show. Yeah, in ninety one or ninety two. Uh, but both of them, I think uh, Patrick came from a quite a wealthy family anyway. I think he had his own flat in Angel already. Mm. And Steve, you'd go around to Steve Coogan's house because he was doing so many adverts. Yeah. He would literally have checks for more than we were going to earn in the year <laughs> i know just lying on the floor they hadn't even bothered to take to the bank yet you know there was just um, i'm not sure things. that world exists anymore but it was it was fairly mad it was a crazy world you know i mean I, I i once went in and did a voiceover for barclays bank and it was just the end line saying you know barclays bank something like that you know some yeah. gibberish and uh and it was and then i rang my agent and said yeah, i've done that she said all oh, right was it i said it about took about 10 minutes she said okay um look it's going on 10 commercials they're going to use it for 10 commercials so really um i've looked at the equity agreement and uh, they should pay you 120,000 pounds but uh we're going to do it we're going to do a deal for um for 55 all right I mean, what sort of question is that? It's absurd, isn't it? I should be ashamed of that. I should also say, where the fuck is it? You know, but, um, but uh, you know, I mean, things like that are absolutely ridiculous. I look at yeah. kind of young actors now and think, you're just never going to get that chance. You know. Do you think, though, that in some ways, you know, we stayed poor and we kind of were just jealous of them for having all this stuff. But then, you you know, you're, you're more driven to i'm not that you haven't worked but you're more driven to work if you've got a bit of comfort and, and a bit of yeah I've, I've absolutely never been well i've never but i've never been um uh, i've never been that interested in the money which is why probably i'll just take the job you know people say it's this much money i go yeah fine i don't you know i don't i very rarely turn things down i actually did turn down a job today strange enough okay. having been you know what locked down for six months the first job offer i get i go nah nah i'm too comfortable I don't want to go out. I want to stay indoors. It's a nice thing, isn't it? I kind of like that. As this well. was flying to Spain and uh, and okay. you know all that sort of malarkey. And I thought, no, I don't want to come back and isolate. So yeah. I turned a job down. You know, Fair but enough. I can. I mean, I mean, I'm sort of in that position now where I sort of go, well, this is nice. I'm having a nice life. You know, and thank God you're paying me though. <laughs> <laughs> of what? course. Yeah. You're going to be. You'll be able to buy a house. Yeah, yeah. Off of this, definitely. It's going to be fun. enough of money. I hate. I've, I've, I've never. I'm really not interested in it. I've never, honestly, never been um, motivated by it. And I, and I don't think you should be. I think. It's I don't think you should be as well. I think that's that's true. But you know. But and I think that it, it, equally, as you say, it, it means if you're not worrying about money, then you can take a job that you think, oh, this looks like an interesting job, rather yeah. than I've, I've got to find a, like the, a, something. Yeah, I've done loads of those. I've done loads of those sort of going off and doing plays. Uh, people have said, why are you doing that? I mean, in fact, uh, I turned down, I was supposed to go to do a commercial for in um, in somewhere gorgeous, like like uh, some sort of fantastic Paradise Island. And they said, uh, you know, this is the money, and it was ridiculous money, and it was for a German chocolate bar. And uh, uh, Reason's Chews, they're called. And I was supposed to go and do this commercial. And uh, they said, Doug, it's easier if we just put you on a package holiday. So, you know, because it, it's quite expensive to fly out there and fly back. So do you mind going for two weeks? And I said, no, don't mind. I, they said, actually, if you want to you bring your family? I went, okay. Uh, and then the next day, I was offered only fours and horses. Right. And so I cancelled the commercial. I did only fours and horses for 500 quid. Yeah, and uh, you know that's a good decision. Yeah, you because know. no one would be coming up to you going, "You've got any recent got any chocolate chew, on you?" A chew, chew, chew. <laughs> they might be, and then you have to give out chocolate, and that'd be harder to get come by. <laughs> uh, so look, I want, there's a few things on okay. here that I want to talk to you about that I have not heard you talk about. You were in Tiswas, which was my as a kid was my absolute favourite show. Yeah, you played Norris Cribb. Do you remember yeah. being on Tiswas? Yeah, that was. Uh, we went on several times, in fact. Yeah, we. In fact, one of the occasions that I remember is we were doing a show. We were on tour, and we were in Stirling in Scotland doing a show. So we did a show in in Scotland in Stirling at night, and then our stage manager, we hired a camper van, and we drove from Stirling to Birmingham 
where they filmed Tis Was. And we parked outside the, the place, got there about four in the morning, and we parked outside and, and got a little bit of sleep. And then we went in, and we walked into Tis Was, and the bloke said, hi, all right, great, yeah, we'll change you to your dressing room. And we went into the dressing room, and he said, I'm sorry, you know, we're a bit crowded today. Do you mind sharing? And we said, that'd be all right. And in we went, and there, standing at the sink, with his shirt off, having a shave, was Sting. And <laughs> I, I absolutely, I mean, if he'd said to me, you know, will you marry me, I would have done. He was, it was one of the most gorgeous sights I've ever seen. And, and he went, hi, guys, you know, went, hi, yeah, Sting. You know, it was very weird. And then we, yeah. then we went on and did the show, and it was great, great fun. And we went back several so, times. Well, again, it was one of the, again, I think, again, me being a little bit young, too young for Python, I never saw Python on TV, things like The Goodies and Tiz Was yeah. were my introduction to that kind of, that kind of anarchic humor. I basically thought Tiz Was had created that sort of humor, which they did uh, to some extent. They yeah. sort of created, I suppose, the the gunge element of TV that then became very popular <laughs> on adults TV years later. But uh, it was sort of an anarchic show uh, with an amazing cast of, of disparate people. But uh, yeah, but yeah, it meant uh, when I when I went moved to the southwest from the Midlands, uh, I, the guy came and fixed up our TV and, and we and my sister said, "Is Shangalang on?" Because she was a big Basic Rollers fan. She said, oh yeah, that's on. And I said, "Is Tiz was on here?" And he went, "No." And I lit, I cried because uh. Tiz was wasn't. They didn't I was show 28 it. years old as well. That's <laughs> um, I mean, uh, from that, Helen Atkinson yeah. Wood, who was in Radioactive, uh, was was picked up by Chris Tarrant and went on and did the the adult version of that. He did OT, yes. OTT. Oh, yes. Yeah. Yes. yeah which which we are absolutely talking about. Good, Nobody has the faintest good. idea of what we're talking about. They do. They love this. Will be, this will be going down well with my They'll be Googling. middle-aged demographic. Okay, that's good. It's going to be fine. You uh, were in Home James. I was in Home James. This, this, that's the Jim Davidson. <gasps> Jim Davidson, yeah, where he was the uh, the chauffeur. Yeah, I played yeah. I played a sort of a, a posh bloke. I can't really remember it very well. I do remember that I didn't like him. I really <laughs> didn't, you know. And it's that's not common. I'm, I, I get on with most people, and uh, it's a very strange thing, you know. That thing when people immediately you think so. Well, this is your television program. You're the star of it. And the moment he met me, he went, yeah, of course, you know, I mean, I'm probably one of the biggest stand-ups in the country now. I mean, the, the shows I do. And it just launched into this great thing of just a list of things as to right. why he was great. And yeah. I thought, well, I, I sort of know that. You know, why are yeah. you telling me? It's, it's very strange, weird. isn't it? Well, it's, there's a weird insecurity with certain some, – some people don't have it. I think, again, I heard you talking about the Only Fools and Horses – this cast being very welcoming, and yeah, lovely, to stay and, and tri- chipping ideas and stuff like that, and and I guess you can be insecure. They they could have been insecure. Those guys, they could have. What, what if the next show isn't the big show? But they probably felt fairly secure. I think maybe but, that know, was think, that was insecurity with him. I think it probably yeah. was. He felt that he needed to sort of, you know, in a way, I suppose the problem is that he suddenly thinks, well, here I am in a world full of actors, and I'm not an actor, yeah. and so he, you know, I can understand it, but I, I didn't, I didn't particularly like him. I've, I've come across him once or twice since, and I, I just, I don't know. There's something about that world that I don't like you know yeah. whereas that where other people from that world who i've come across are just brilliant shane ritchie is one yeah. is one of the most entertaining and funniest when i went we did benidorm together and yeah. he was absolutely fantastic and he's got no fear at all of you know those things where people sort of go oh god people are looking at me the public know i'm here the public yeah. you know he turned up at his hotel said anna mike yeah great right so we're going for a swim i went yeah, sure. Okay. So I said, um, where do you want to go? And he, he said, he said, well, the pool. I said, but it's a, you know, loads and loads of people there, Shane. And he said, yeah, it'd be all right. No, it's all right. No, it's, no, it's no problem. No problem, mate. No problem. We went down and he spent the next five hours talking. Hello. Yeah. 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 yeah Shane. Yeah. 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 It's healthy moon. Yeah. All right. Okay. Yeah. Come around my place. I'll give you one. Yeah. Hey. All right. See you. Love. Bye. Bye. Yeah. Of course I will take just photos and everything. It's, it's extraordinary. So yeah. you can never don't don't ever define people by the sort of uh, in a way the the area of the business they come from. He's he's a brilliant bloke, but um, you know, so it's not. It's sort of, I think it's interesting because you've sort of parachuted into some. I mean, not Benidorm because you've you've had a recurring role in that, but in a lot of these other shows, you've parachuted in for one episode. Yeah. So you get you know you get a sort of bird's eye view of of what the people are actually like. You know, because if you're a, if you're a cast member every week, then you're going to sort of 
become part of the team. Yeah, I mean, in a way, they all going in every now and again. They, they've got a, they've got a, you know, they're invested in in keeping you on board. I think if you if yeah. they know you're coming back, you know, yeah. whereas you can either just say hi and have nothing more to do with people. You know, or you can go, hello, oh, no, no, great to have you on for this week. Oh, yeah, no, and, and you can chat. And that's exactly what Only Fools and Horses did. David Jason was just brilliant. He said right at the start, okay, now everybody stay around. Don't, you know, don't just rehearse your scene and go home because it's really nice to have other actors in here. We can bounce off you. And if you've got any ideas, come, you know, put them forward. It, we had a brilliant, we played a fantastically evil game at lunchtime every day, which was, uh, you'll like this game. It's called Look Away. It was um, basically we had to pick the most famous person in the restaurant uh, at the North Acton rehearsal room, and that was absolutely rammed with everybody who was on television. And I remember picking Nigel Hawthorne, and uh, and what you had to do was one by one, you had to sort of slightly catch their eye and go, I, I, and just just nod at them and just give that sort of friendly, you know, as if you knew them look. And we did it over the whole period of the lunch, very slowly. And the idea that David said was that the moment that they acknowledge you and wave back, you all look past them and watch them crumble. It's it's wicked. It's a wicked thing to do. But we did it. We did it every lunchtime, and it was very funny. <laughs> <laughs> that's his, Poor Nigel Hawthorne. He never recovered from he that. He never that did. Was, his career was he, he just completely lost his confidence. And then he, he went mad, apparently. Did you see that film where he went mad? I did, yeah. Yeah, he apparently turned into a nutter. <laughs> What's the little girl in Outnumbered, really? Like, I bet she was horrible in real life. No, little, she was Oh, I God. bet she's a, a diva. No. Swearing, annoying, drinking. I know, yeah, absolutely. Well, the, the, <laughs> the really annoying thing is that they're better than you. That's the thing, you know, these bloody children. You go in there and they are just so good. And not only that, it's um, it's really interesting that those kids are all having lessons all day long. So they're being tutored while you're filming. So we would film everything and then they would be shipped in for about an hour. Right. So um, if you, uh, the interesting thing about Outnumbered, um, which I can say, and, and this is a little known fact, is that I'm in more, I'm in, uh, apart from Hugh Dennis and uh, Claire Skinner, I'm in more episodes than anyone else uh, because right. because I did all the recordings for the, the background noises, so the radios and the televisions and all that sort of stuff. So, in fact, I'm in loads and loads of episodes, but nobody knows I'm in them. But the one episode I was in, when the children are not in vision, they're not there. Right. So, so it really makes you admire what, Hugh and uh, Claire do you know because you sort of go wow that's amazing all those scenes where you're having arguments with the kids if it's a close-up of you those children are having lessons you're doing it to a an AD with a script you know it's it's brilliant so then of course they turn up and and they're not actually given a script they're told to um you know the idea of the thing and then say things and uh, the little one you know the girl you asked me about she did a line in it which I thought that's extraordinary to have that nerve she said yeah all right Mr Piggy Eyes you thought, all right, yeah, okay. I've not got the biggest blue eyes in the world, but it was. See, she was a she was a monster. She's a monster. She was a monster. A monster and should never be allowed to act again. She shouldn't have been allowed to grow up because <laughs> they the could have. Got they the could have used future. drugs like you know uh, Nadia Comaneci, young or cloned her and just kept on bringing up. <laughs> it got weird. It got weird. They got they got they grew. I mean, they're adults now, aren't they? They're all grown. They're yeah. all grown up, basically, kids. So it's, yeah. it's freaky when they. It's not right. They shouldn't be grown up. And one of them's called Tiger. Yeah. And it's not fair, is it? No. Not in life. Not really. So um, this is your bank manager, Tiger. What? <laughs> well, his dad is bend over. Isn't that right? His Tiger's dad is bend over the uh, yeah, I think adult so. film actor. Yeah. I believe so. And mm. his mum is, is, as well, I think. Mm. So, you know, well done. I He... Bend Over was one year in Edinburgh, was doing a show after my show. Yes. Uh, and Bend Over, at, at the end of his gigs, most people have T-shirts or books to sign. He would have uh, dildos of his own penis. <laughs> <laughs> Modelled on his penis. <laughs> he would tell to people and people would buy them. So I, sh- I should have done that. I don't know if that was before Talking Cock. I think that was before Talking Cock. I should have done that with Talking Cock. I should have said, <laughs> right. There was a, so while, we're, while we're on ideas, I want, to, I want to ask you a question. While we're on the ideas of uh, you know having an idea and then not doing anything about it, I had an idea for a Black Mirror episode the other day. Okay. Based entirely on on the fact that now, now I've got involved in podcasts, I noticed that they fund themselves to a large extent by saying to people, well, if you want to listen to it, 
you sort of got to listen to a little bit of advert first. And I thought, what if the world was like that? So, in fact, if you wanted to turn on your light, unless you were rich and could afford to, you know, get it without the advert, you'd, yeah. you'd press a switch and it would say, new Sanzo Osram bulbs. They're the best bulbs in the world. Get Buy your bulbs from Sanzo. Then the light would come on. And if you wanted yeah. to start your car and get cheaper, elect- cheaper petrol or whatever in your yeah. car, you'd turn the switch and it would, do an advert for new tires and stuff. So everywhere you go, there's adverts. Not only that, um, they're, because they're sort of um, adverts are specific, like they are on podcasts. They know what your listening is and what your buying, you know, preferences are. So they aim it at you. That would also be the case. So you could have a situation where somebody turned up with a parcel from, you know, Amazon or something, and they'd knock on the door. And in order to get to the free delivery, you'd have to have an advert. So you open the door and the man says, bussy dominatrix, and, and while your wife's in the background. And then you, you sort of go, no, no, I'm sorry, you got the wrong address. They go, no, absolutely, we know you. We know all your, your buying rate. So do you think that would be, do you think? I don't think you should do it on Black Mirror. I think you should do it. Just like, well, let's start up that as a bit. I mean, you've given, you've given away the idea now. You've ruined it. I know. What, I've done, is I've, no, no, what I've done is I've copyrighted it. <laughs> <laughs> My boot. But we should don't do it because if you, I, I was, t- I, I sent a Black Mirror idea to Charlie because yeah. he was on, and it was only just in. I can't remember what it was now, but it was quite a nice idea. Uh, and then the next week or a couple of weeks later, his wife was on, and I said, "Oh, you know, I sent him some, but it was sort of only a joke. That was something we talked about." And she said, "Oh, he can't if he he can't even read it. He's not contractually. He's not allowed to read anything that's sent to him. Really? So that." He can't, you know, people can't, which is what I do as well. People send me scripts, I just say, Look, I can't read this because yeah. I've been no, in I case they then say, it. Well, you've seen it and it was my yeah. idea. And yeah, yeah. so if it. anything comes up later, if you, if you don't open it and don't look at it, then uh, there's nothing they can do. So, yeah, don't give it to Brooker. Okay, he will just we'll, ignore it. We'll put a warning at the beginning of this uh, this uh, episode yeah. of the podcast. Charlie Brooker, if you're, l- you're listening, don't. You'll be in big trouble. He'll be very excited. I'm sure he was a big radioactive fan as well. <laughs> He's the right generation. Let's talk about your podcast because I have been on it, and it's a lovely idea for a podcast. And what's I mean, you weren't really you were, was it your first introduction to podcasts? Absolutely, I've, I've become a podcast virgin. I don't think I'd even listen to one, uh, you know, which is mad. And my son, it's my son who drove me to do it. He kept saying to me, "Do a podcast. Do a, have you not heard what Richard Herring's doing? Do a podcast." And I kept saying, "He can do it." Yeah, if it, for God's sake, <laughs> it's easy. And and uh, and I just ignored him for about three years. Kept saying, "I don't, I don't want, I don't, go, go away." And then eventually, I thought. Well, you know, I'll have a go. I'll I'll test the waters. So I emailed a few people to say, look, I've had this idea, which is a very simple idea. I just say to you, you know, it's called my time capsule. And then you tell me the five things from your life you'd like to put in a time capsule. And four of them are things that you like. And one of them is something that you find a bit embarrassing or you'd, you'd like to get rid of. And that's it. And yeah. what do you think? And And everybody came back saying, that's a really good, you did. You know, it came straight back and said, that's a really good, nice idea. Yeah, I'd love to do that. And I thought, oh well, that maybe it's a maybe it's going to work, you know. I mean, when Stephen Fry comes sort of back within minutes and goes, ah, oh, no, absolutely, ah, oh, dear darling, you know, and you know, you think so, well, yeah, okay, I'll have a go. And it's I'm really enjoying it. I really like it. I'm really into podcasts now. I, I love. I think it's nice you've got access through all these people you work with to like this amazing potential for one cast. week. Yeah, you know, I work with all these people for one week. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But you're afraid, you know. But it is. I suppose it's a little bit similar, though. I, I don't know. I, I often have guests on. I don't know at all. Yeah. Uh, but, but you're. But you know, you do. You have got had some. You had Griffey Jones on, who's never done a podcast. No, he's never. And I don't never. think he ever will again because he's not bothered about things like that. You know, why would he? He's got no need for it. You know. And actually, yeah, I went round to his house, and uh, God, what a house! What he's one of his houses, sorry, and uh, in Fitzroy. Fitzroy uh, I won't say where it is, and and it's just a beautiful house. It's this fabulous house, and we sat in his kitchen, which is a bit like being in Albert Hall. Not good for sound effects, but he just sort of just didn't hold back at all. Yeah. But why would he? He has nothing to protect. You know, he's he's yeah. he's done it all. You know. Well, as I was thinking, we were, I think it was before the podcast we were talking about this, but like when people have have made it that far, yeah. They will talk a lot more openly about stuff, and are very good fun guests. <laughs> uh, and when people are just starting out; they're very good fun guests. Yes. It's the people in the middle who are kind of worried about where things are going. Who <laughs> have don't have a massive house uh, in the middle of London, but yeah. Uh, have you been asked 
what well, I'd be interested in what's the one thing that you the, the bad thing that you would put in your time capsule. You must have thought about this yourself. Me? Yeah. Yeah, I don't know. See, now people tend to go for something that's a bit funny, you know. Uh, it, and uh, and I don't I don't blame them actually. You know, you don't really want to go completely soul searching. Uh, I did. Uh, I was once. I, I was quite. I was a bit of a. I was a twitch twitcher, which is appropriate, isn't it? So yeah, I, 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 are they called twitcher or twitters? Yeah, I was. I, I used to go bird watching, uh, and with with a mate of mine, and we were once uh, grabbed by this gang. When I was I was twelve years old, and we were marched off to a wood. Now you're really worried where I'm going now, aren't yeah. you? Yeah. No, but they tied. Make this kind of thing. We can. Yeah, no, they tied it. They they old. tied us to a tree, and fired arrows at us. What full on real arrows? Real, uh, they'd made themselves, but they were bows and arrows. They'd made themselves, but they were stuck in the trees. Wow! It was really terrifying. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, and the only way to get out of it was uh, if they eventually said, well, right, we'll let you go if your best fighter fights our best fighter. And because these lads were about 14, 15, so they were big lads. And we yeah. were tiny. And my mate, who, who from that day was not my mate, uh, said, he's the best fighter. And they untied us and let him go. And he ran. He ran like the wind, you know. And I had to basically take a beating from this bloke. And then they let me go. So I'd like to get rid of that because every now and again yeah, it crops up again. You know, it's just one of those, you know, you go, oh, shit, that wasn't nice. It's a weird thing. I mean, I was thinking that's obviously, again, when you have kids and you relive things a bit through your kids and yeah. you, you know, I was thinking it was nowhere near as bad as that. But uh, there was a time I was at a track event. My sister was a good runner and she was doing a track event and I went off to play in the playground and there was no one really around. And there was a little tunnel you could go through and I got halfway through the tunnel and then two older kids uh, and I was probably about eight, I was probably eight and they're about 10 but they had a little pen knife and were kind of threatening me with a pen knife and I think because I didn't cry and freak out they went yeah you're right mate you're right you know and then then they accepted me as a friend but it, I was literally you know very terrified I was about to be stabbed you, they never in needed these things they never and, you, and, you, and it's really stuck with you that I would, and then you, you know, all you know, those you, things I, I had I've had I've had, I, I, I went into a swimming competition when I was a, in junior school uh, Mrs. Thistlethwaite was the teacher. I'm going to name her, bitch. And uh, she, she, she said to me, "I said, can I swim four forty yards instead of two twenty, which is you know, and get the four forty yard badge for my swimming costume?" And she said, "No, you, you'll never do it in time, Michael. It's not possible." And I said, "No, I'm, I'm really fast swimmer, Miss. Let me have a go." And so she said, "All right, are we going to show off?" I said, "You know, that's not fair. Just I'm a good swimmer." And uh, so I did it. And she didn't really monitor me because I was swimming up and down faster than the other kids. And uh, and and I got to the end and I got out and I said, I've done it, miss. I've done it. Looking up, thinking, oh, you know, like three minutes to go to the end of the lesson. I've done it. And she said, no, there's one length to go. And I said, no, they, no, it's either two lengths to go or, or I've done it. Yeah. So logically, there couldn't be one length. It's an even number. And she told me to go and get dressed and to, uh, she put me in detention. And I never yeah. got the four forty. Never. I hate her as well. We all hate I her. Was don't quite, we? I was quite good. I wasn't very good at sport, but I was quite good at medium distance running. Mm. But the, the games teacher hadn't really realised that. And I did a fifteen hundred meter race or something, and came in second or third. And the teacher said, "Not." And I said, "I finished." He said, "You have not finished, Harry. Go around again. So I had to go ah. around again. Do another four hundred meters because he didn't believe that I'd come. I'd done that well, but I was actually a pretty decent wow. mile runner." <laughs> and that sticks with you. <laughs> they really stick, don't they? These things. It does it's weird. Oh, these terrible. I broke my arm in a in a high jump at, at junior school, right? And uh, and and again was told to stop making a fuss. And when I got home, and and the bone was sort of almost sticking out of my flesh, my mother nearly fainted. Although she was a nurse, and yeah. we went to the hospital, and the, and even the doctor went, oh. So what school? What, what school were you at? I was at <laughs> school. <laughs> the kids I, are being attacked. Never right send out. your children to Hogwarts. That's what I say. <laughs> never. <laughs> well, it's a great, a great podcast, and that's the kind of thing you can get on your podcast that you don't get on mine because I don't have the time capsule question. But I did this time. Yeah, uh, it's called my time capsule podcast. Do check it out. Amazing uh, guests. It's, it's well worth uh, your your time to listen to that. Everyone, it is fantastic. Um, did you leave your reading glasses at my house when you have you lost a pair of reading Almost glasses? Almost certainly, but I wouldn't worry about them because they're always from a pound shop. 
Are they okay? That's don't worry fine. about it. Because they're they're t- they're two point zero minor one point five. Oh, uh, no, all right. They look like my, my. These are very cheap ones as well. Does that, on does that make it one old? <laughs> <laughs> my eyesight's better than yours, but they're no good to me, is what I'm saying. Yeah, okay. but I'll hold on. But, yeah, hold on, because eventually they will be. It's a bit further, <laughs> and that will be fine. Good. I, I meant to ask you that off off camera, but you know. There we okay. Go. Um, and oh, I wanted yeah, to ask you, you about Bella's pudding. Yes, well, Bella's pudding. You found the recipe. Yeah, I've done the recipe. I I remembered it for your podcast. It's one of the things I put in your time capsule. That's right. And then, it, and unfortunately, you you held on to that podcast, and I then mentioned it in off menu, and it 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 exploded literally. Yeah. The, it literally exploded. It could have been me. But somebody um, whose name escapes me in the moment. I've got it written up there because I've got the recipe up on the board back there, but I won't go and look. Uh, but Venkner, I want to say someone Venkner. It might be that. Right. Uh, emailed me a recipe for something that. Is I I'm pretty sure is if it's not it is more or less it. Yeah. So I did make I made it for James Acaster. I would have made it for you if you'd been the only one. Well, I did if suggest when we were doing it. You know, it. No, no, uh, I have a feeling that had you had I put mine out, it wouldn't have exploded. <laughs> so you know, I, I'm uh, I do my best, but I just don't have the hair to be James Acaster. No, what can you do? No. But uh, it was very very sweet, uh, and it was. It wasn't nice when I made. I was quite impressed by when I made it. How it, I looked at it, thought, oh, this isn't going to be it, and then you'd stir it, and suddenly it changed, and then you've cooked it, and suddenly it was solid. When I ate it initially, it didn't taste anything like it, and then I left it for the day, and then I, I ate it the next day, and it was bang on. So <laughs> it's better to be served hot, I think. But I'd, if you make it, wait a day, yeah, and have it cold. Don't worry about the meringue so much. I, I did a pretty good job, but. Um, off my tits on sugar I, in that podcast. I ate some. <laughs> I, <was> like, <laughs> and I eat a lot of sugar, so it must be sugary. I just went, poom. <laughs> we don't want to see you go poom. No, I had. I, I haven't been eating chocolate for like a year and a half. I gave up, I told you before, I gave up drinking, yeah. but I gave up chocolate at the same time. So I haven't eaten chocolate since 2018, except when occasionally little bits are cropped up in mm. like a, a biscuit someone's given you or whatever, or some ice cream. Uh, but then my wife was eating um, 95% dark chocolate. I thought, well, that'll probably be okay because right. that won't push me back onto it. But I had one bite of that and uh, I think my eyes went, <laughs> and I was, <laughs> I, 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 I haven't taken many drugs in my life, but if you, if you want to have a, an amazing drug experience, <laughs> stop eating chocolate for 18 months. And then do and it. Then eat just a nibble of 95%. And then you went out and you, you cleared two tons of stones <laughs> at four o'clock in the morning. I know, yeah. It was extraordinary. <laughs> let's talk. Um, there's a lot more we could talk about, but um, uh, let's. You've been in Mr. Bean, but you you were there with Rowan Atkinson at the kind of not the birth of his creations, but because you worked with Richard. Yeah, uh, Curtis. yeah. I've, I've, got, I've sort of quite early days, you know. Those yeah. things. I did actually. I went down to London to see um, to see Richard. In fact, to sign a, the contract for the Heebie Jeebies for the okay, album. Right. They yeah. they he was because uh, he was involved. He said, "I've got all the contracts here. Come come and sign them." So I went down to London from Oxford uh, on the bus, and I went to his place in um, Camden Town. And the Camden Town Boys, they were known as, I think they still are, that crowd of people who were all friends at that time. They're still the, called the Camden Town Boys. And uh, and I went in and we, we sat there and had, you know, tea and toast and uh, and I looked through the contract. Even though I was studying law, I've never been able to read a contract. I just sort of pretend I am. I sort of go, mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And I never read it. So I didn't. And then I got to the end and I signed it. And then we were chatting. And, and all the time this was happening, this piece of piano music was playing in the background upstairs. Uh, but it kept stopping and starting and stopping and starting. And then eventually Rowan Atkinson came downstairs and they were sharing a place at the time. And he put the cassette in the thing and said, oh, hi, Mike, uh, right, uh, what do you think of this? And he put it down, and he did the the piano player sketch that he did at the opening of the Olympics. Yeah. Uh, uh, so, and that was the first performance of it. So I saw the very, very first performance ever of that thing, because Richard had not seen it. Yeah. And he'd, he'd, you know, I think it sort of sums up his nature, really, Rowan, that, that he'd been upstairs working on it for hours and hours and hours, just perfecting it. And then showed it to us, you know, and, and uh, of course I thought it was perfect. And Richard had several pages of notes, you know. <laughs> That's pretty extraordinary to get that one man. Now, if you can get Rowan Atkinson on your podcast, that would be an amazing. Yeah, thing. I mean, it, he does, it I really, think. it really isn't. There are several people. There are a couple of people I'm going. I will go for Rowan eventually, and I'm going for yeah. David Jason as well. You know, so they're the sort yes. of people who don't, you know. But uh, those sort of um, those being at those extraordinary events, it's one of the real joys of. Uh, 
of this whole thing i think you know i was uh, we did the 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 opening uh, nobody knew it was going to become as big as this but i remember the opening um theater performances for comic relief when they had the idea of comic relief to raise money initially they did shows at the shaftesbury theater in london and they did five nights of shows and we were invited to go and sing the heebie song in it and it had all these extraordinary people. It's got the famous sketch with, uh, with with Lenny Henry and Frank Bruno, sort of, you know, basically both pretend to be Frank Bruno, and and Lenny Henry is better at it than Frank Bruno. Uh, it's it's got all those um, where he does the Philophius be wildebeest sketch, you know. And you, have you got any got any African in you? Do you want some that joke? And uh, uh, which I'm not sure is terribly PC anymore, but there you are. Uh, See, it's okay for Lenny Henry. It's okay for Lenny. You can get away so with it. You can, you can say, you say anything, it. anything at all. Anyway, we did this, and then at the end of it, we were told, look, don't, you know, when you've done your bit, don't go off, which you often do at these charity things because they go on and on and on. But, um, you know, we, it was so exciting. You know, people doing stuff and the people coming, you never knew who was going to come on next. And they said, stay around because at the end, we'll all go on and we'll all sing uh, Feed the World. So I thought, wow, that's good. And uh, so we then gathered in the wings as the last act finished. And Bob Geldof and mid came out and, and, you know, it's Christmas time, said Bob, you know, saying Bob Geldof very badly. There's no need to be afraid. And mid sang his bit. And then they came to the bit where you sing, it goes into the chorus and we were all lined up in the wings. And when we all walked on and joined in, and I found myself standing in, I can't imagine how this happened, Rich, but I found myself standing right behind Kate Bush. And uh, and it was coming up to that moment. And it's a that's a very exciting thing to do. And she turned around and she, she looked at me and she said, an exciting. <laughs> and I t- honestly, the, the idea that someone like Kate Bush would, yeah. would ever say something like that to you, you know, and you'd yeah. be part of it. It was the most incredible thing. The idea, And I love the fact that she just, she'd never lost the wonder of it all. She'd never, yeah. you know, she wasn't so sort of big and done so much that she just went, just another gig. You know, she still had that that real enthusiasm for the whole thing and, and thought it was magical. Yeah. Lovely. I, 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 thought, I, I kind of hoped I'd marry Kate Bush. Uh, Didn't, I mean, I'm prepared, if she's watching... You should get Kate Bush on your one. She'd be good. If you're watching, Kate, I'm prepared to leave my wife and the kids to come, even now. That's all I'm saying. Okay. Even now. I would run up uh, that hill. So I, I, I resent you for even getting to Kate, talk to I'm running up that hill. <laughs> I will run up the hill. I'll jump out the window. <laughs> I'll run across the moors, oh, whatever I need to do. Babushka, babushka. Uh, well, well, it's no Michelangelo, but it was. it's good. Um, so, right. Well, we there's... There's no more time. We've no. done it. We've done an hour. Uh, we've had a lovely time. We'll have to get you back on another time. <laughs> okay. And uh, are you going to do more with the? Uh, we made it up to about. We, 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 we have done it. Ever- maybe, maybe we did do a little tour last year, and it was very good fun. But basically, it was an excuse for us all to go and have lunch together every day. <laughs> That's what it was. We would sell merchandise, and at the end of it, we'd add it all up and go, "Oh, we did well today. Okay, well, we can go to a really posh restaurant tomorrow." So we would just then look up in the Michelin star restaurants on the route yeah. we were taking and stop and have lunch. So it was a, a very self indulgent tour, but brilliant fun. And you still, you still get. It's a difficult thing with a sketch group. Uh, you're still getting on. Oh, we 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 ready? get on extremely well. Yeah, I and mean, do I mean if anything uh, better? I think. We're much, much better with each other. We're much more honest. We don't ever get annoyed with each other particularly. It's, you know, we've all gone, yeah, 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 you're doing that thing again. I don't care. You know, and it's just it makes us laugh. It's much more fun. Yeah. It's interesting. Yeah, John Cleese asked me that a long time ago. Do you still get on with people? Because, you know, we don't. And I, I mean, oh, don't you? You know, I, I thought it's, um, yeah, I did an audition for the, the uh, A Fish Called Wanda. Right. I didn't get the part, sadly, but, um, you know, but I remember him saying that and thinking, "What well, do people not get on then? You know, I think it's, you know, sometimes it's a good thing. I think there are people there, are, you know, there, obviously I've been in double acts and sometimes things are good and sometimes things are bad. I think it's difficult when you're, I mean, you've been all around the world with these people and yeah. toured all around the world. So you've really got to like each other. <laughs> I think it can often be, I think in Python, see, I think that's interesting. Uh, when I talked to Michael Palin, Terry had recently died and I think, uh, Terry and Terry Jones and mm. John Cleese rubbed each other up the wrong way quite badly, but I think that's what made it probably work. almost certainly. Yeah. Yeah. I, think, I 
think that I think it was I think they needed that, and I think John Cleese needed that that irritant, and and Terry Jones needed to be irritated by yeah. someone not getting, and the, because they were pulling in different directions. I think that's what made the the whole of it so good, yeah, but yeah. also yeah. was going to make it difficult for them to. Stay yes, and Eric Nidal long. just wanted to do spam a lot, really, didn't he? That's what he wanted yeah. to do. Yeah. And eventually he did, and they they were yeah. then then they were all furious that he made all that money, and then they didn't have any of it. <laughs> See, again, that's money. It's it's not worth it. You know, we we yeah. had a we had a brilliant time together. We had a fantastic. We were you know things were fractious, obviously, because you, you get tired and you get fed up with each other. But actually, uh, the moment that we all stopped working together, we all just carried on going on holiday together, and that's when you have the most fun. You know, we would just have lunches and we would, you know, meet for lunch and we would gather together on, you know, anniversaries. And then, of course, sadly, uh, Jeffrey Perkins died, who was in, in our group. He was probably one of the greatest men I've ever known. And um, and that was a that's a very binding thing that when you've lost a, a, a great friend like that, you know, so sure. there we are. Let's finish on a laugh. <laughs> 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 well, I hope you do do more. Is uh, I think it's such an important show, and yeah, I think for a lot of people coming up through that 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 time as well, it's the, it's a weird thing with radio shows because they do sort of live on and they get repeated on yeah. the on rate four extra and that sort of thing. But I think they're all so much of their time that, that they mean so much to the people who kind of grew grew up through them or listened to them as they as they were coming up. Yeah, and, uh, but it did, and I think we chucking in. We did it in Edinburgh, and the great, yeah. the very uh, pleasing thing is because I'm I'm terrible at trying to flog merchandise. I go out and play the the, the queue. You know, come on, programs. Here we go. Sign programs. You want to sign? I'll sign it. And, and I'm terrible. I'm like a, a running a market stall. Uh, but it means that I sort of get to meet the audience, and I and yeah. and then. There were lots of people there who came when uh, no, we we loved radioactive. And they were all sort of probably about your age, you know. They were teenagers when they listened yeah. to it, and and then they were there with their teenage children, and yeah. and who and you say, do you know what this is? And they go, well, they used to play it in the car. I don't really know, no. you know. And then and then afterwards, because I'd rush out to sell more merchandise, shameless, uh, I would meet these people and I say to these kids, did you like it? They said, oh yeah, it was really funny. And we were doing exactly the same material. We we're doing stuff from yeah. the 80s, you know. So um, yeah. that's very pleasing, I think. When yeah, that's lovely. And, and it, but it's such it's a fun show and it's a, it's a sort of silly show and it's about yeah. silly ideas. And it's that kind of cartoon. It, when you compare it to On the Hour, they're sort of in a similar area, but they're sort of, they come at it from such different directions. Absolutely, yeah. And I think I prefer radio. <laughs> I know I <laughs> I know, I know that's difficult for me to say, Let's but I like, you know, I like that. I think the silliness, uh, and, you know, and the the joy de vivre of it, and the characters in it are so over the top. Yeah. And, uh, and great. I won't make you do them now. Let's, okay. uh, let's let's wrap it up before I start asking to do quotes, uh, ladies and gentlemen. I don't know who's on next week. We might not even do one next week because we've got a few in the can, and I might have a rest. Yeah, you never know. Uh, but the, if you're listening at home, there will be one next week because that's how uh, time works. La- ladies <laughs> and gentlemen in the chat room, please give it up for the amazing Michael Fender Stevens. Thank you. Lovely to talk Remember, to you. See you again next time. Goodbye. <laughs>